this is our last session and we're going to be talking about the cultivation of contentment, which I have titled as the fruit of the gospel, as we reminded ourselves at the end of the last session that our growth in Christ-likeness, our growth in learning contentment is all by the grace of God that he has lavished upon us in Christ. And uh, so we're gonna talk about some specific things that we could do by God's grace by God's grace. A number of years ago, my husband sent a text to our daughters and myself about some of it. I don't remember what it was, but he said, it went really well, BGG. And we were like, BGG, what does that mean? Well, he meant by God's grace. So that has become an acronym we use. You're welcome to borrow that. We, we do that a lot, BGG. We actually have a lot of those in our family. It's very, very fun. So I'm going to just list off some, some things that we can do as we cooperate with the work that God is doing within us to help us cultivate contentment. And um, my, my desire is that each one of us will, will find some, some way, something that we could do uh, to honor the Lord as we grow in this process of cultivating contentment. He has told us to be content. He has commanded us to be content. And Paul has described it as learning contentment. And so may God use our time in this session to help us learn more about being content. And the first one that I have listed there on your handout is to monitor our minds. Monitor our minds. And we're going to spend more time on this first one than the others because I have become convinced over the years that this is the heart of the battle <laughs> is being aware of what we are thinking and um, what lies we're listening to, what thoughts we allow to fester and play over and over and over again in our minds. And those thoughts can help us learn contentment or cultivate discontentment. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time here. Our thought life to a significant degree determines our contentment. Now, in my reading, I came across this list for fostering contentment that I put on your handout, written by E.B. Pusey, who's just listed as a 19th century church leader. And I, I wanted you to have it to see, because again, it's a little bit old Englishy and long sentences, but please follow along as I read these things. A list for fostering contentment. Allow thyself to complain of nothing, not even of the weather. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Number two, never pitch, picture thyself under any circumstances in which thou art not. Ooh. Number three, never compare thine own lot with that of another. Number four, never allow thyself to dwell on the wish that this or that had been or were otherwise than it was or is. God Almighty loves thee better and more wisely than thou dost thyself. Number five, never dwell on the morrow. Remember that it is God's, not thine. The heaviest part of sorrow often is to look forward to it. The Lord will provide. That's a good list, isn't it? And it's interesting that a lot of this list focuses on just what we allow ourselves to think over and over and over, what, what we allow to linger in our minds. And it is right here that so much of the battle for contentment takes place. You can kind of sum up this list in don't allow yourself to think about things in ways other than what God has ordained. Just don't go there. God has ordained that it be pretty cold for you all this morning. <laughs> it's not, I feel, I think it's balmy here. <laughs> in Louisville, the forecast for next week is in the negatives, like negative one, negative two. So I'm, I just might stay here. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> but not even the weather, not even the circumstances of our lives, not comparing with other people. God knows and loves you, each one of us, and he has placed us where he wants us to be. 
But if we allow our minds to go down the path of if only, or why not, or why her, why her and not me, we will be feeding that temptation toward discontentment, will we? won't we, if we go down that path. Now, one of the items on his list, I think, really gets at the heart of a lot of our discontentment, and that is to never compare thine own lot with that of another. I think this is one area where disciplining our minds hits at the root of so much of our discontentment. It is so easy to look at others and to compare. And you can always find somebody who has it easier, better, happier, whatever, and you can feel very discouraged and, and sorry for yourself. I think self-pity is closely related to discontentment. Or you can find someone who has it worse than you, a harder life, they're really suffering. And it can lead to kind of a self-satisfaction, a, a self-righteousness, if you will. But comparing ourselves with others is foolish. It shows that we are without understanding, we read in 2 Corinthians 10. Some people have said that comparison is deadly, and it certainly is the death of gratitude if we're comparing with other people. When we are faced with this temptation, and it's really a common temptation, we need to remind ourselves that God does not call us to be looking at others, to want to be like Mary or better than Sue or whatever it is. God calls us to be looking to Christ and focused on him and saturating our minds and hearts with his truth so that he is changing us to be more like him. Our, our gaze needs to be vertical rather than horizontal. We, we don't want to spend much time looking this way. We need to be fixed on accepting who he has made us to be, what he has brought to us, what he has withheld from us. That's his right, that's his prerogative. He's God, we're not. One author wrote this, I thought this was interesting. You will never really enjoy other people. You will never have stable emotions. You will never lead a life of godly contentment. You will never conquer jealousy and love others as you should until you thank God for making you the way he did. That's interesting, isn't it? Just accepting this is how God has made me. And then you kind of move on. <laughs> This is who I am. God's making me more like Christ. So, so think about this. I, I'm not called to be like Mary or like Sue. I'm called to be a more Christ-like me, more Christ-like Jody. You're called to be a more Christ-like you. And I, I think when we compare, we miss so much of the beauty of variety. God obviously loves variety. He could have made one flower. He made hundreds. Could have made one kind of tree. He could have made one kind of geography. Look at the variety of the geography throughout the world. God loves variety. And look at the variety of people, human beings made in his image. And we're all different. And he loves that. He delights in the variety. But we sometimes in our kind of self-absorption and self-pity try to kind of blend in and be like everybody else, right? We, we just are so quick to compare and, and focus on others rather than focusing, focusing on the Lord. <clears throat> There's a wonderful verse at the end of the Gospel of John, John 21, when Jesus had talked with Peter about Peter's love for the Lord and the Lord's calling on him to feed my sheep. You remember this. I mean, it's so beautiful. Peter had denied the Lord three times, three times. Christ asked him, do you love me? Lord, you know I do, then feed my sheep. So there was just this beautiful restoration between the Lord and Peter. And then Jesus gives Peter a hint about how his life may end, and it's not necessarily a pretty picture. It's gonna be a hard, a hard way to end, a hard way to die. And after that, Peter turned and he saw John. He's looking this way, right? And he says, Lord, what about this man? What about this man? And I love Jesus' answer to Peter. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
you follow me. Basically, Jesus said, mind your own business, Peter. Just mind your own business, right? But I think that's such a helpful question. What is that to you? You follow me. So we, we are looking this way, we're comparing. Oh, she has such a gorgeous house. I could say that about Karen. She has such a gorgeous house. What is that to you? She's such a gifted pianist. I like to play the piano, so it's easy to me to look at pianos. Thank you so much, Iris, that was beautiful. But she, she's such a gifted pianist. Well, what is that to you? She has such an effective ministry. What is that to you? She has such an important career. What is that to you? She has such a sweet marriage. What is that to you? Her children are so gifted. What is that to you? She gets to travel all the time. What is that to you? You follow me. Don't you see how so much of our, our discontent comes from looking at what God is doing in other people's lives and wanting it for ourselves rather than trusting his wisdom and his particular work in each one of our lives to make us more like Christ, and that's going to look differently in each one of our lives because he alone knows infinitely and perfectly what we need and what we don't need. Now we struggle, we all struggle with comparison. I think that's because we're human and because we're sinners and because we live in a culture that is consumed with comparison. It's just in the air we breathe, isn't it? I, I was thinking about this thing, sorry, sorry. Think back a hundred years ago when most people in America at least lived in smaller towns and they just saw the people in their small town, right? And there wasn't all the advertising, there wasn't all the movies, there wasn't all of this. And so they just kind of were around ordinary people and they accepted themselves as an ordinary person. I'm sure there was sinful comparison, but in general, I think it was probably easier. Now, we are exposed to the most beautiful women in the world and, the, and their photos are airbrushed at that, you know. So there's just this, this standard that is just highly unattainable. Uh, people used to just be, live in their own home and in the, visit a few friends. Now we are all exposed to the homes of the rich and the famous and the most gifted interior decorators. <laughs> It's easy for us to compare and covet. I speak as one who is not gifted in that way and I have to really guard my mind and my heart. But you think about what life is. We're just exposed to the best of the best of the best, right? And it's so easy for us to feel like we fall short. <clears throat> you know, last night I said that discontentment is having what we don't want or wanting what we don't have. I think it is frequently wanting what you have wanting what you have. And we are, we're able to see what the richest people and the, the most famous people, what they have. And it's a, a temptation to be discontent. So let's let this piercing question of Christ just resonate in our mind. What is that to you? Whatever God is doing in somebody else's life, that's between that person and God. What God is doing in my life, that's what I want to be focused on. I want, I want to use that question to reorient my thoughts when I go down those paths of comparison and of envy. Let's turn to one of Jesus' parables, that of the laborers in the vineyard in Matthew 20. Matthew 20. I'm not going to read it, but I'll just summarize it for us and then pull out some lessons from it. And in this parable, you may remember, Jesus described a master who hired laborers to work in his vineyard for the day. And he promised them a denarius for working for a day. He hired more workers later in the day and more later still, more in the day. At the end of the day, he began by paying the most recently hired laborers and he gave each of them a denarius. So those who had labored all day thought, wow, if they got a denarius for just working a little bit, think how much we're gonna get for working the whole day. But they complained when they received the promised denarius. That's what the master had told them and that's what he gave them. The master replied in Matthew 20, 13 to 15, we read, 
Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Do you see that there? When we see God blessing others in ways that he has chosen not to bless us, do we begrudge his generosity with others? He has everything. It all belongs to him. He has the right to do what he will with all that he has. He owns us utterly and completely. We do not want to begrudge God's generosity with other people. William Plumer, one of those wise Puritans, said, if thine eye is evil toward thy neighbor because God is good to him, it is proof that thou quarrelest with providence. And if God should give to one of his children more than he gives to you, has he not a right to do what he will with his own? We do not want to quarrel with providence. When we compare what God has done and is doing in our lives with what he has done and is doing in the lives of others, and we feel we come up short when we envy others, when we're dissatisfied, we are begrudging God's generosity with others. We're quarreling with our wise, sovereign, loving, providential ruling God. We don't want to do that. What an affront that is to God. He is God. But it's hard when others have been given things that we long for, when God has poured out blessing on someone else and not on you, it's hard, it's hard. I think a verse that is really helpful here is Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And I think in our kind of muddled thinking, it's easier for us to weep with those who weep you know, we women are pretty compassionate and we like to come alongside and, and, that, and that's a beautiful thing. But to rejoice with those who rejoice, especially if they're rejoicing over something God has given them that he has chosen not to give you, that's really getting at the heart, at the root of a lot of our pride, our thinking we know better than God. But it is a sign of Christ-exalting maturity to be able to rejoice with others in those situations. It's something that we need to pray about, that God will change our hearts, that we can genuinely rejoice when we see his blessing in other people's lives. It's not simple. I mean, it is simple, it's not easy, but it is simple. Rather than envying others in sinful discontentment, God commands us to love one another. Think of all of those commands and love and envy don't go together. They're kind of mutually exclusive. Think of the ways that we are tempted to sinful comparison and, comparison, and then think about the ways that we are commanded to love each other. Let's read those familiar verses from 1 Corinthians 13 and think, think about discontentment and envy. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Another passage that would be good for us to read through regularly and pray through regularly. Okay, so here's the Elizabeth Elliot quote for this session. And this one just gets me. She wrote, if I imagine that I love my neighbor, let me test my love by asking how glad I am that he has achieved what I have failed to achieve, that he has managed to acquire what I have long wished to acquire, that he is loved by someone or by many or in some way that has never been granted to me. 
if I love my neighbor as myself, as we're commanded, there will be no reason at all for the least twinge of jealousy because I will be just as happy that he has what I wanted as I would be if I had it. Oh, isn't that powerful and convicting and true and helpful? We need to monitor our thoughts. What am I thinking when God blesses somebody else in ways that I wish, wish he blessed me? So comparison, I, I just think that's at the root of so much of our discontentment. So here are a few statements I just um, pray might help us as we seek to love others, love them rather than compare ourselves to them, rather than envy others, and let those kind of roots of bitterness and discontentment uh, build in our minds. Comparison says that my value is found in relation to others. You know, where do I stack up? God's word says, my value is found in creation and redemption. I am a child of God, redeemed by the shed blood of Christ. That's who I am. Comparison says, I have to prove myself and find my significance in self-attainment. God's word says, I could do nothing to prove myself, but Christ has done everything, and my true identity is found in him. Comparison says, I need to compete with others for my piece of the pie. You know that kind of sense, like there's only so much goodness and blessing to go around, and if she gets it, then there's less for me. I mean, it's just so silly. God is infinite in all of his goodness. He has all things. God's word says, I need to think more highly of others than myself and love them and serve them rather than compete with them. Comparison says I need to fit in and blend in with those around me to be like everyone else. But God's word says each one of us is uniquely gifted to serve others within our church family. And that will look different in all of us. Comparison traps us in small, self-focused, even at times paralyzing ways. We just turn in on ourselves. Oh, it's just so ugly. God's word calls us to freedom in Christ. To be free, free from that self-focus, that self-absorption, that self-pity. <clears throat> A couple more things I want to say about monitoring our minds. I think there are two E words that are helpful for us to think through. The first is expectations. Expectations. How much trouble we bring upon ourselves how much harder we make it to learn contentment because of our expectations. We place expectations upon those around us, upon our circumstances, indeed even upon God for how we think our lives should go. If we only understood more clearly what we should expect. William Plumer says, he who expects nothing because he deserves nothing is sure to be satisfied with the treatment he receives at God's hands. Keep our expectations low, ladies. It really is a key to contentment and happiness. A second E word that's related to monitoring our minds is entitlement. Entitlement. It's not difficult to see that we live in a culture that is consumed with a sense of entitlement. My needs, my wants, my rights. These are the ultimate values for so many people. And that cultural pressure influences us more than we realize. But again, we are entitled, truly entitled to only one thing, everlasting condemnation because of our sin. So we need to constantly remind ourselves of that fact. So we've been talking about guarding against comparison, but here's a comparison I think that we should practice regularly. Compare what we deserve because of our sin with what we've been given because of God's grace. I think it would serve us well in cultivating contentment to regularly and deeply think about our sin and about the offense of our sin against an infinitely holy God, to reflect on what we would be, should be, justly facing eternal torment and separation from God, and then compare that with what we've been given, both in this life, so many blessings, undeserved blessings, but especially in the life to come. The, the little book, Valley of Vision, that collection of Puritan prayers, there's a section in there that says, 
Oh Lord, I am astonished at the difference between my receivings and my deservings, between the state I am now in and my past gracelessness, between the heaven I am bound for and the hell I merit. Are we astonished at the difference between the hell that we merit and the heaven we are bound for? We need to think about these things regularly to put all of this into perspective. So let's work at monitoring our minds. This is most of the battle, I think, for cultivating contentment. Don't think about things in ways other than what, than what they are not. Avoid sinful comparison. Be aware of a sense of entitlement. Be modest in our expectations and regularly think well, what, what we deserve and what we've been given in Christ. And as we fill our minds with these kinds of true reflections, we will grow in cultivating contentment. You know, we can't allow wrong thoughts, uh, lies just from coming into our mind. They come in, these thoughts, our, our, our minds are twisted enough, you know, and we think things that we ought not to think. But we do have some control over what we allow to stay and to ruminate over. You know, God, God's word says, set your mind on things above. So that instructs us that we have a sense of choosing what we think about. That's what God tells us to do. So let's be careful, let's be aware. What are the thoughts that just recur over and over and over again? Are they true? Are they lies? Does this line up with God's word? Where am I thinking wrongly? Where am I not loving God? Where am I not loving others? And replace those lies with true truth. All right, number two, and I promise the others are shorter. Or we'd be here all day. I'm sorry. Okay, number two, guard our hearts. <clears throat> As we fight for contentment, we need to keep our eyes and our ears and our mind and ultimately our heart from being filled up with things of this world. When I limit my exposure to things of this world, they just lose their allure for me. And I am it's easier for me to be content in Christ. You know, our, there's an advertising industry that is, I don't know, multi-billion dollar industry that is purposeful about cultivating discontentment in our hearts. It just makes sense for us to limit our exposure to that. We don't need those things. So just be careful about what you are reading, watching, listening to, what you're exposing, what you're allowing to come in your minds, your eyes, your ears, and deep within, are the things that you are taking in lending, himself, lending themselves toward cultivating contentment or discontentment? Where is your heart after leaving, leafing through a crate and barrel catalog? Does anyone know crate and barrel? I love crate and barrel. It doesn't foster contentment in my heart. <laughs> but meditating on the Word of God does. So I want to be sure that I am more focused on this and less focused on that other stuff. I thought of this recently while reading the parable of the sowers. The, I'm so, sorry, the parable of the sower or the parable of the seeds or the parable of the soils. I've heard it called all of those things. But in Mark 4.18, we read about... Um, others are sown among thorns, the, uh, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. What a sobering reality that is, being caught up with the things of this world, desiring these things, chokes the influence of the word in our lives and renders us unfruitful. That's so serious. So guarding our hearts against too much worldly influence, including the materialistic influences all around us, is important for eternal, God-honoring purposes. One practical tip I have for you is just to limit your recreational shopping. It's been so interesting in my lifetime. I remember when, when I was young, shopping was something my mother did one day a month, and she would dress up you know, hat and heels, and go downtown and shop and get whatever was needed. The rest of the time she was at home, pretty much, unless she was at church. And nowadays, it seems like if you have free time, oh, let's just go shopping. Let's just go, let's go to the mall, walk around, let's just see what we see. Such things do not foster contentment. They foster discontentment. 
<clears throat> Lydia Brownback says, guarding what we watch, read, and hear isn't legalism, it's just sanctified common sense. I think that's so true. So let's grow in sanctified common sense. And don't hang around, don't read, don't watch things that are going to tempt you to discontent. Guard your heart. Number three, foster gratitude. Foster gratitude. Remember that cycle of contentment we talked about last night? We need, God provides, we thank him, he is glorified. Gratitude is the active acknowledgement to God of his goodness, his complete provision, and it breeds contentment. None of the good gifts that God gives are deserved or should be expected, but he continues to pour out blessing and to meet our needs. I think it's helpful for us in thinking about contentment to think about thanking God for what he gives and also for what he withholds. If there is something that we long for, we've asked God for, we've prayed about, he in his wisdom has chosen to withhold that. We thank him for that because we recognize he knows better than I do. He knows I don't need it. He knows how I can grow in depending more upon Christ. So we need to constantly come back to God's sovereignty and wisdom and love. And we humbly bow before him, acknowledging that he knows better than I do. There are a couple of verses in the book of Job that I, I love. They describe this concept of thanking God for what he gives and what he withholds. Job 121, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. The Lord blesses, the Lord withholds. Whatever he does, we bless his name. I may have mentioned this here before, I don't remember, but a number of years ago, my oldest sister, Judy, so I, I'm the youngest of five girls, all of us are Jays, Judy, Joyce, Jan, Jill, Jody. We used to sing together and my mom sewed us matching outfits, the whole thing. My oldest sister, Judy, is just a remarkably godly woman. She's just walked closely with the Lord for years. Her son, James, had graduated from Wheaton College and was headed to China as a missionary. And just before he left for China, he was killed in a car accident. And it happened in the Chicago area, and it happened the weekend that Bruce and I and our daughters moved to Chicago. And and um, so James' family, Judy and her family, came out from California to Chicago for the funeral. And Judy and I went downstairs into this basement apartment where James had been living to pack up his belongings. And, and we're weeping. We are grieving. But she looked at me through her tears and quoted this verse. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I knew that she was clinging to the truth that she knew to be true, even though everything within her tempted her not to believe that truth, not to believe that truth. I want to be that kind of woman who, when whatever comes, whatever comes, that I can see God's hand behind whatever happens, you know, behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Another verse from the book of Job, Job 2.10, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Again, we just need to be focusing our minds on the truth of who God is and his sovereign purposes so that whatever happens, whatever he brings, whatever he withholds, we choose to trust him. We choose to trust him. Related to giving thanks, I, I've been thinking about this Kind of the opposite of giving thanks, I think, might be complaining. Does that, does that ring true to you? And I think complaining comes so easily to us. So let me just encourage you with this word from Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I think all means all. That's, that's what I've picked up do all things without grumbling or complaining. And I think there is such wisdom in that. As we guard our mouths from speaking words of complaint, 
it will help us guard our hearts. And when we allow our mouths to start complaining, and you know, complaining is very contagious. One person starts and the others join in, right? But if we allow ourselves to complain a lot, we're going to be influencing our hearts to be ungrateful. We're going to be cultivating discontentment instead of contentment. I, I, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is true. This is what we read in God's word. But what we say with our mouths influences our heart. It's kind of a cycle, kind of a cycle. What we say over and over. So one habit that I have found helpful, I don't do this every night, but most nights I do when I go to bed and go to sleep, to go to sleep, I think about, I think back through the day and think about three things that I can thank the Lord for. And that has helped me, you know, even on the worst of days, you can find something. I mean, you're still alive, you're still breathing. That's a gift from God. Find three things that you can thank the Lord for. And it just kind of helps your mind go that way rather than the complaining discontent way. And I, I, think it, I think over time, it helps you to have a more grateful heart. And I read in a secular woman's magazine about a study that had been done with severely depressed people, people who were so depressed they couldn't get out of bed. And they had them do this exercise. They would write down every day three things they were grateful for. And that's all the treatment these depressed people received, and it really helped. And I'm glad, glad that worked. But I just want to say to those people, who are you thinking? It's one thing to, to be thankful, but it's another thing entirely to thank the God who gave all good gifts. We are so privileged as his redeemed daughters to know the giver of the gifts and to be grateful and to be thankful to him. So let's guard our mouths and cultivate a grateful, thankful heart. But again, it's that balance, thanking God for the good gifts that he gives, but thanking him more for who he is and what he has done, holding those gifts loosely. Number four, cultivate a God-directed worldview. Cultivate a God-directed worldview. We need to intentionally develop a bigger worldview. We're all so prone to my life, my world, my experience, what I have right here. And I think it helps us cultivate contentment to learn about the lifestyles and conditions of most of the people around the world. Now, I don't know what specific financial challenges some of you may be facing. There may be some serious challenges in this room, but we're all clothed and we all had food and we had food, food right in here. And if you take a look at the world as a whole, we are all really wealthy. I tried to find out statistics, and I read two different ones, so I don't know which is accurate. But I, I read that all Americans are among the richest 3% or 1% in the world, which is pretty astonishing. All Americans, even the poorest among our country. And so if you lined up all the people of the world by income, all of us would be close to one end. And, and that's, that is just a difficult thing for most of us to think about. So it helps us to learn about how most of the people around the world live. And a couple of, of um, resources that I would recommend in this, one suggestion I have is to build a friendship with a missionary that your church supports and learn more from her what life is like wherever it is that she is living. Just helps us kind of get us, our eyes up out of this United States. I think John Piper calls it Disneyland. That's pretty much true, isn't it? We all live in Disneyland. Disney world, I better say here. I'm from the West Coast, so. <laughs> Another resource I would suggest is Operation World. Do you know that book? It's so helpful. It's updated regularly, but it goes through each country in the world, talks about what's going on there politically, economically, and missionally, what God is doing in that country. And it's just a couple of pages on each country. So you could read through that, pray for that particular country. Just again, get our eyes up off of ourselves. An organization that we have supported for years now is Voice of the Martyrs. 
it is so incumbent upon us as Christians to remember and to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are dying or being tortured, being persecuted because they name the name of Christ. We are to uphold them in prayer. We are to support them in whatever way we can. And it helps put my wants, what I think I need to be happy, in perspective when I remember that and I look at the pictures in the thing, the mailing that comes every month. Honestly, when that comes in the mail, it's hard for me to look at the pictures. People who have been burned because they're Christians, but it's good for me to look. It's important for me to look. Again, it just lessens that grip that the stuff of this world has on my heart. So we need to grow as world-minded Christians. <clears throat> Number five, grow in selfless giving. Grow in selfless giving. Look for ways to be givers. Many, many years ago, we had the privilege of attending John Piper's church for a year. It was, it was a joy. And I still remember one of the sermons from, from that time. He preached on Ephesians 4.28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so he will have something to share with the one who has need. And he said, when you think about money, there's kind of three ways to deal with money. One is to steal it, which he was not recommending, and neither does God's word. The second is to work to have, and the third is to work to have to give. Work to have to give. And as we learn to give of our money and our possessions and our time and our energy more freely, then we become freer from our addiction to the things of this world. God is a generous God. God is a generous, giving God. And as we grow more like him, we will grow in generosity. At our previous church, one of the elders was George Sweeting, who used to be president of Moody Bible Institute and pastor at Moody Church. He had a phrase that he used all the time that I love, seldom resist a generous impulse. Seldom resist a generous impulse. If God has brought something to mind, a way that you could generously help somebody else, that's a good thing. Don't resist it. Carry it out. We want to be generous people who honor truth about God by the way that we live our lives. He's a generous giver. So let's grow in being selfless in our giving. Number six, develop an eternal perspective. Now we've touched on this earlier, but we need to think carefully about what lasts. What really lasts for eternity? The way I see it, the word of God, God's truth, and the souls of people. That's what, that's what lasts. That's what matters. That's what we ought to be investing in. And one thing I love about growing older, and by the way, there's a lot of good things about getting old, so don't worry about it, all you youngsters. There's a lot of good things. But I see this more clearly, and I have a slightly better grasp on what matters for eternity. In Ephesians 2, you know, one of those classic passages that we all love, we're familiar with those truths. We're dead in our trespasses and sin, but God has made us alive in, with, together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's where we're heading. That's what we have to look forward to. In the coming ages, he will show us more and more of the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. That's what matters. That's where we're headed. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul teaches concerning the day of the Lord when Christ will return to punish the disobedient and save the faithful. And in verse 11, he says, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So I ask myself the question, how often do I encourage others with the truth? The Lord is coming again. How often does that spur me on to evangelism? because of the truth that the Lord is coming again in judgment. 
So many of the people around us live with no hope for the future. They have no sure and certain hope of what is coming, what they're headed toward. And so, of course, they look to the things of this world for meaning and significance and purpose and redecorating the house or planning another vacation or acquiring things, whatever it is. That's all they've got. That's all they've got, but it doesn't last. So where is your heart today? Where is my heart? Are our best energies going to be concentrated on what we can acquire in this world? Or are our best energies going to be spent in serving others for the glory of God? Are we dazzled by the things that are seen? Or are we longing for the things that are unseen? Let us remind ourselves regularly that we are sojourners aliens, strangers, traveling through a foreign land. Our true home awaits us. Things will be hard here. We won't have everything we want or maybe everything we think we need. I mean, that's, that's the way life is here on earth. But it's not going to last. Here's my favorite quote, so get ready. It's, I think it's my all-time favorite. Thomas Watson says this. It's on your handout. Death begins a wicked man's hell, but it puts an end to a godly man's hell. Isn't that so true and so telling? The people around us may be having a great time, you know, a living life to the fullest, but that's going to come to an end. And then there is eternity apart from Christ. For those of us whom Christ has redeemed, life may be hard here on earth. It may be really hard. You may be in a very difficult situation right now. And if you're not, we probably will be. But it will come to an end. And so if we have 60, 70, 80, 90 years, whatever God gives us here on earth, that are really, really hard, it's going to just fade like that. And then we have eternity with the Lord as he displays the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. So let's let that truth of what lies ahead shape the way we look at life now. So much of what attracts us and entices us and allures us just doesn't matter, and it isn't going to last. And if life right now, right here on earth, is really, really difficult, remember that it won't last and your death will end the hell that you may be experiencing here on earth. But then there's eternal joy and blessing of being with the Lord. The sadness will cease, and the eternal joy will begin. <clears throat> Here's another Lydia Brown back quote. We came in with nothing, and we will leave with nothing. And anything we get in between is fleeting and temporary. If we would just view our lives from this perspective, our capacity for joy would enlarge. Oh, don't you want your capacity for joy to enlarge? Contentment would become much more than an occasional mood. It would characterize our entire life. So let's cultivate an eternal perspective. We are, we are not at home. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. So don't look to the things of this world to, to bring you comfort, security, hope, purpose. They're all passing away. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Um, but how can we grow in having this correct perspective? How can we give more weight to the things that matter for eternity and less weight to the things that we see around us? You may remember earlier I said about how we are tempted to, uh, to have desires for things without inquiring into their real value. So we need to value things accurately. What lasts for eternity? A few years ago, Bruce and I bought a new bathroom scale. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious that you just laughed. <laughs> and it's a real nice one. <laughs> and it's more accurate than the one we had before. <laughs> and we found out to our chagrin that for years we had been weighing ourselves without accuracy. <laughs> um, 
we thought we weighed 10 pounds less than we did. So we were weighing ourselves without accuracy. But isn't that how we are all tempted to weigh things, to value things without accuracy? We give too much weight, too much importance, too much value to things that don't really matter. So we need to have our scales, our weights adjusted by the straight edge of God's word so that we value what is truly valuable and don't give too much weight to things that are just temporal, things of this world, things that don't matter. Hmm. We could go into, a, I, I don't have time, but I think one very practical application of this is we want to value what God thinks so much that we value very little what other people think. It's a way to restore our, our sinful tendency to fear man, fear too much, give too much weight to what other people think. We don't want to disregard what others think. We don't want to be an unnecessary offense. But may God help us value far more, what is more valuable, what God's perspective is, what he thinks. And just let all of this weight of, oh, what do they think about me? Do they like me? Just let that diminish because it doesn't ultimately matter. <sighs> number seven, number seven. Look to Christ, our example. As we seek to grow in contentment, let us look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus lived his life here on earth in the power of the Spirit, and now he gives to us that same Spirit with the same power. Jesus models for us true contentment by submitting to the will of his Father. You think of all of his statements, especially in the Gospel of John. It, it is my meat to do the will of my Father. As it says in the King James, I speak what the Father gives me to speak. I do not speak on my own initiative. I speak on the Father's initiative. Jesus lived his life here on earth in a, just a, a life of contentment and submission to the Father. And he models that for us so beautifully, trusting the Father to lead him, to guide him. We, we read this so often, the Spirit led him out into the wilderness. The Spirit brought him back. That it, just read the Gospels and notice how often it says how the Spirit was at work in Jesus. And then Jesus, you know, it's interesting, when he goes away, when he, he says to his disciples, he's leaving, but he says, it is to your advantage that I go away. And they're, of course, thinking, how can it be to our advantage that you're leaving us? But the advantage is that, not, that now they and us don't have Jesus walking beside us. We have his spirit living within us. So let's look to Jesus as he lived his life in submission, in just perfect contentment, Walking in obedience, carrying out the will that the Father had for him. Walking step by step in obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. One more Elizabeth Elliot quote. Jesus loved the will of his Father. He embraced the limitations, the necessities, the conditions, the very chains of his humanity as he walked and worked here on earth, fulfilling moment by moment his divine commission and the stern demands of his incarnation. Let's think regularly of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He poured out his heart to the Father. If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. So he, he knew what he was facing, dr uh, drinking the cup of God's wrath that we deserved. He, put, he asked God to take it away, but then he says, not my will, but yours be done. So friends, let's grow as women who are pursuing contentment, a, a submissive spirit toward the Lord, what he brings, what he withholds, Certainly, let him know the desires of your heart. Let him know what you would like that you don't have. Let him know what you would ask him to take away that is difficult. But then let us 
model our lives after Jesus and get to the point of saying, not my will, but yours be done. That is the place of true freedom, true joy, true eternal purpose. How we want to be women who embrace God's particular wisdom and love and purpose for each one of us. He's making each one of us more like Christ. So let's look this way. Fill our minds and our hearts with God's word. Guard our uh, faculties from being too influenced by things around us. Let's cultivate an eternal perspective and ask God to help us value the things that he values for his glory and for our good. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is our savior and our redeemer and our walk and our fortress and our example. We pray that you would help each one of us see him more clearly, cherish him more dearly, and follow him, Lord, by your grace, through the power of your spirit, and through the tremendous gift of your word, we pray in his name. Amen.